Well, the entrance to the hall, really, and the courtyard, and you have to remember that when it was bought by the Elmhurst, it was a, a farmyard and a terrible mess. Um, and the garden designer that really transformed it into what we see today is a lady called Beatrix Farrand, an American garden designer. She's also famous for Dumbarton Oaks, which I've had, I have seen. And the genius of what she did here was the paving, where she did um, pebbles, Yorkstone, limestone, Yorkstone and pebbles. So you're unaware of the actual space that it takes. Well, I was at school at Ashburton. I was head girl, believe it or not. And uh, Peter Sutcliffe's sister, who was a lovely, lovely lady, she was one of the school governors, must have heard about me. I don't know, you know. And uh, somehow I came for an interview with lovely Mr Johnson. And uh, the training scheme had started, I think, in the sort of after the war. Um, and he said, you know, you can start in September. And when I came uh, in 1963 and we pruned, can you imagine? There was no um, hoist or anything. We used to wobble on top of a ladder to clear the roses and all the plants out of the guttering. So I've got pictures of me wobbling a ladder, on a ladder to uh, prune these. It was hard work. I mean, it was different. We worked in the gardens, you know, and we started at half past seven in the morning and finished at five at night. And uh, it was just sort of sheer hard work. I mean, in the winter, um, you know, we would start in the mornings at half past seven and we would go down to the cattle breeding centre, which was down in the village. And we would, until breakfast time, which was about half past eight, we, me included, would would dig out the cattle manure or the bull breeding centre manure and load it on the trailer and it would come up to the gardens and then we'd dig it in. So, you know, by the time we got to five o'clock at night, we were kind of pretty tired, I think. In a garden like this, you need to be very aware. I mean, we're lucky to have the heritage of the original designer, Beatrix Farron. Um, and these cedars are um, her planting and her design. Um, and she, the importance of choosing plants is that you go to the nursery and pick the plant. Um, and she went to Hilliers to pick these. She picked these herself. This is one, for me, one of the most important trees in the garden. This is one of the original plantings of Thai Hakkyu. Um, and what's really special about it is that it's grown as um, a bush form and not a standard. So when Dorothy would have looked from her study across here, the height of this tree grown as a bush as opposed to a standard the height of the blossom would have all been the same height. So this is nice. This is just, this was the sort of Elmhurst private space. Um, it's called the lodger. The Im other important thing here is the yew hedging that sort of gives some sort of privacy. And one of the first persons that came was a man called Avery Tipping. And uh, it's due to him that we, that those hedges exist. I was in the private house three times a week watering the plants. You'd kind of go in at about half past seven in the morning because Dorothy liked plants in the morning room. So you'd have to go in and then on the morning room table, oh no, outside there were two plants either side and big planters that you would change on a regular basis. This is um, a luckum oak. This is a hybrid oak. Um, some of the best specimens are in uh, Devon and Cornwall because Mr Luckham was a nurseryman at Exeter. Um, but it's a, a slightly annoying tree because you clear up all the leaves and then in January it drops it and it goes, oh, I forgot autumn again. I'm terribly sorry. So you're sweeping all the leaves of this one up. But the best ones are in the southwest of this. It's a hybrid oak and allegedly he's buried in a coffin of 
like a moat, but the story went that he thought he was near the end, had one cut down, planked it up, stuck it under his bed, went on a bit longer. By the time they looked at the planks, they were, the woodworm had got them. And so they had to cut down another one, allegedly. That's the story that goes about the Luckham Oak. This is another sort of classic part of the garden. Very beautiful. You've got, this is leading towards what's called the Azalea Dell. Um, very beautiful with um, just plantings. This is um, Palestrina. Absolutely fantastic. Morning. This is by the sculpture Willie Sukop. Um, I never met him, but he was uh, quite an interesting gentleman. Um, and what's interesting, this is fed by a spring. Um, and if you look, the water varies in pressure and height. Um, and sometimes in the winter, if you get the right winter conditions, the water that comes out of these little um, bubbles, it, I've seen it sort of frozen in like glass marbles, and it's beautiful. Um, and this was originally um, the open air theater, uh, and the hedge went right across. Um, and it was particularly, there's lots of photos of the Bally Yost waltzing about in there. Um, and so the later part of the gardens is really from after the war. Yeah, so this is the sunny border, one of Dorothy's absolutely favorite parts of the garden. And we used to work on the border and she would work on the top border. It doesn't exist anymore up there. And she would like to know what people asked and what people were curious about, about them really. So she, you knew when you were working here, she'd be listening on the top of the border, which was, which was fine, fine. Not a problem at all. Um, but mainly she liked soft colors, blues, yellows, pinks. There's very few harsh colors in the garden, no variegated on it under any circumstances, which I think is the right thing. Yeah, we ought to just pay tribute to Willie Sukop's donkey, really, because uh, there's a lovely picture of me about age four sitting on him. So I must have made a wish when I was about age four and didn't know I was going to spend the rest of my life here. They really appreciate, yeah, they, uh, they did appreciate tradesmen, people that worked in the woods. Yeah, they were engaged in all of it. There were people like Vic, who was a bit of a character, but he'd like served on the Arctic convoys. So there were a lot of really, you know, there was lovely salmon in, in the garden. He'd been in Ireland in the, those 1920s troubles. So a lot came out of wartime experience. And I think the war was such a thing, both wars, to both of them, that it mattered. And I think they were acutely aware of what people had been through during the war, really. I think maybe that's why the trust has survived so long, because of that loyalty in the 30s. <coughs> there was nobody in Totnes that was employable that didn't have a job, and I think they gave so much employment. I think that loyalty survived until their death, really, the fact that they'd kind of given employment to people and, you know, I think the figure of how many employed at one time was about 3,000. It's a huge number, huge number. Um, and also, we're coming now, um, we've moved on from um, Beatrix Ferrin to the lovely Percy Kane, who was a bit of a character. Yeah, so this is probably one of Percy Kane's most sort of famous, yeah, um, all the gardens he designed used this York stone. Uh, 
but the snag to it is incredibly slippery in the wet very very dangerous leading on from the Percy Kane steps this the glade is really attributed to uh, Percy Kane so that the higher you go up the glade the more you've got in the landscape and another aspect of landscape is you use what's called borrowed landscape so you might do your garden and plant your trees and things but you need to be aware of what other land is outside the space that you are actually creating and so here we're spoiled really because mainly the borrowed landscape we own all the land you know the, the estate is a thousand acres but the borrowed landscape that way leads towards Torbay and you can't in a garden like this or any garden ignore the geology and the geology of this garden really is limestone um, as I said before but you go just a few miles that way not even maybe three or four and you're into that lovely Devonian red sandstone which is lovely makes the sheep pink um, but it grows the best root vegetables round here if you buy if you've got any sense in the winter you buy potatoes and root crops that have been grown in that red soil because they just they pick up something from the red soil yeah, you just pick the right day to come to one of the triumphs of the garden. These are the old beech. And beech in relation to this garden is very important because the thing about beech instead of oak is beech does this and it's very gentle in the landscape. Um, whereas oak, oak they say dies on its feet, whereas beech you will suddenly just drop a branch, but it's really quite, um, I think it's one of the more trees that we should put back in, but of course it's very prone to squirrel damage. And the other important thing that I love about beech at this time of year is this. Um, and trees, this is the little casings that come off the leaf buds and they protect the leaf casing or the leaves from the frost and so it's a wonderful it acts like a duvet for the tree and it acts like a duvet for my strawberries so the strawberries absolutely love it as a mulch and I don't know why we don't appreciate it more because it's so important to the tree um, and I've done some strange things which I have reported is I know living at Mark would understand this living at Darrington you meet some interesting people um, and there was a year when I walked up here and the beech leaves were terrible. They had holes in them and they looked really not well. And I said to one of my interesting friends who's an electronics engineer, do you think we can do anything about the holes in the beach? And he went, oh, I don't know. So I brought another friend who's very good at hugging trees. And we made a list of what we thought the trees wanted. And he made the little crystals and I spent one winter putting these little thing crystals around the trees and you can look up into the canopy now and there's very little damage in the leaf cover whether it worked whether it was coincidence I don't know but it didn't cost anything to set my time and I kept a very meticulous record of all what I did now this is one of the actual defining parts of the garden and you've picked absolutely the right day to come this is Malus hupanensis Chinese tree Dorothy was friendly with a guy called Will Arnold Foster, uh, wrote a fantastic book called Trees and Shrubs for Milder Climates. If you look at Dorothy's copy in her morning room, it's annotated with the trees. And she walks, she talks about walking through the blossom must be like walking through clouds in heaven. And you think, oh yeah, you know, you come up here and you see this in flower. And it's such a magnificent tree, just absolutely beautiful. Again, in Dorothy's palette. So you've got this pure white against the green, that green of the beach. Uh, and they're just absolutely exquisite. And this is classic sort of Dorothy planting in a way where you've got the white of the Davidia and then you've got the white of Palestrina. So you've got the, the balance of color um, and she was really, really, she would treat her plants, I've read this, like a stage set because she loved theatre. So she would place the plants to give that sort of 
theatrical, not in a in your face, but subtle colour to, to balance one another. But what more could you want from a plant than that? If you were walking out on a morning and you just look at that and you think, how does it do it? This is the oldest tree that we've got. This is um, English yew Taxus baccata, uh, planted in churchyards. It lost a big branch once and I've got a lovely table made of this tree. So the, the, the thing about yews is, although they're a hardwood, you cannot date them easily because they grow in a very different form. Instead of a central trunk, they tend to grow very differently. And unlike some of the other trees, um, you can't date them by measuring incremental growth because yew trees are just tricky. They just don't do that. What does the, the, the estate and Darting Crawl Trust mean to you? Oh, everything, really. It's given me a complete... The things that I've been able to do, uh, because of the stability of being in one place and being really related to the land, knowing the trees, knowing the estate, knowing the soil, having the experience of all the people that I've met through being here. It's very hard, having been here so long, to have any sense of time. You know, it's, it's strange, really.